Good morning and welcome to this live streamed broadcast of the service of Holy Eucharist on the sixth Sunday after Pentecost at the Cathedral of the Incarnation in Baltimore. I am Mary Sularud Cannon for Congregational Vitality in the Diocese of Maryland, and our preacher today is the Right Reverend Eugene Taylor Sutton, Bishop of Maryland. We are so glad that you are with us on this day. Please download the bulletin by pressing the red button above the video screen. Join us in the hymns and the prayers. Let us begin our worship with hymn 376, Joyful, Joyful. Sing, ever blessing, ever. 
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, mercifully receive the prayers of your people who call upon you, and grant that they may know and understand what things they ought to do, and also may have grace and power faithfully to accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Romans. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and death and to, and to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For this reason, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. You are in the Spirit, since the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit 
of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the, from the dead will give life to your mortal to your mortal bodies, although also through the spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus went out and sat beside the sea. Such crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there, while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen. A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly, since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, 
that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but carries the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, and who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. <clears throat> Let us pray. Tell us what we need to hear, O oh God, and show us what we need to do to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, some time ago, a preacher writing about this parable described being raised as a member of the Clean Plate Club. And as he describes it, I, real, I realized that my brother and I had also been inducted into that club, although we didn't know anything about it at the time. You see, the Clean Plate Club had only one basic rule. You had to eat every bite of food on your plate. So what if it's high in fat or sugar or cholesterol? Doesn't matter. Just clean your plate. So what if I don't like it? Too bad, eat it up. So what if it hadn't been cooked well? Tough, eat all, eat all of it. Well, of course, my brother and I, we obeyed. Why? Because we quickly learned that cleaning our plates was the key that unlocked a lot of doors for us. At the end of every meal, we were reminded that if we wanted to do anything, then it had to begin first with what? Clean your plate. May I go outside and play? Clean your plate first. May I watch my favorite TV show now? Clean your plate first. May I go to the bathroom? Clean your plate first. Can I go to college? <laughs> Clean your plate first. My, my parents, of course, had the best of intentions. It wasn't an obsession on their part to make us overeat or gain weight or pump up our cholesterol numbers. In fact, we were all pretty blessed in my family to be, to be pretty thin. I weigh more than any of them, but I learned, I earned this bodily frame honestly. I, I'm a bishop who goes on visitations, and I'm always given full plates, and so I'm just doing my job. No, you see, my parents were raised in the Great Depression. If there was one thing you learned when everything was scarce, it was the importance of wasting nothing. Food was too scarce and too expensive a commodity to have any of it go to waste. In fact, wastefulness is a sin. We were raised in a Christian home, and we were taught to be good stewards, that is, good caretakers of all that God has given us, that God has provided for us. Anyone who's serious about being faithful stewards of God's good gifts knows that wasting those gifts is a sin against the giver. It's a sin. It's wrong to waste food, buying too much of it, preparing too much of it, eating too much of it. It's just wrong. It's a sin to waste water when we shower or shave or even wash dishes. It's a sin to pollute our streams and rivers, lakes, and the Chesapeake Bay. It's a sin to waste trees, pollute our air, and desecrate our soil. When we human beings degrade our environment and waste our inheritance of clean air, lands, and waters, then it's a sin against God, against ourselves, against our neighbor, and against our children. I think you may all agree with that, right? And yet right here in this morning's gospel lesson, we are confronted with a strange incident. 
Jesus tells us about a farmer sowing some seeds in the hope of having a good harvest. In those days, there were at least two ways of sowing seeds, which were common. One method was to put the sack of seed on the back of a donkey, tear open the sack, and let the seed run out slowly as the donkey was led throughout the fields. The more common way, and apparently the way Jesus was thinking of when he told this parable, was to tear open the bag of seed, reach in, get a handful, and sling it. The problem, though, is this. The slinging of seed described in this parable was not a very accurate or precise way of sowing seed. As a matter of fact, it was kind of reckless, Archdeacon. (laughs) Dare we call it wasteful? Yes, that's exactly what it was, Canon Sularut. It was wasteful. Let's look at the account again. The sower slung the seed. Some of the seed fell on the path where birds came and ate them all up. Strike one. Some of the seed fell on rocky soil with no good depth, and the sun burned them up. Strike two. Some of the seeds fell among thorns that choked the seedlings. Strike three. But some, only some, fell on good soil that brought forth strong, healthy grain in abundance. You know, it would be as if someone like me, if I were responsible for reseeding the grounds of the diocesan center after the cathedral finishes its planned project for the renewal of this property, think how much seed, if I was out there, would be wasted. Think about what the neighbors would say. Look at the bishop out there throwing away that seed, so careless, so wasteful, those Episcopalians. Doesn't he know that you have to be careful when you're trying to grow a lawn? I don't know anything about that. So the message is clear. Be careful. Be careful with those seeds. Don't sling them. Above all, don't waste them. But in the parable, who was Jesus talking about? Who was the sower? There's some possibilities. Was the sower some young farmer, inexperienced with time-honored practices that protect your investment of seeds? Probably not. Or maybe she has more seed than she knows what to do with. Not likely. Or maybe he's an eternal optimist. You know the type. They think almost anything is possible. Even seed penetrating hard ground among thorns and weeds in the heat of the sun. Oh, God will take care of everything. Anything's possible the eternal optimist. Oh yeah, you can go out in a big crowd inside a building with unventilated air and shout. God will take care of me, eternal optimists. Or maybe the sower is God. And maybe this seed that's being slung all over the place is the promise that the reign of God goes everywhere, everywhere. The sower plants seeds of hope, even in places that seem hopeless. Would God be so reckless in sowing those precious seeds? Yes, Jesus spoke of God as a reckless sower. Of course, we wouldn't dare use those words to describe the Almighty, but we could say to God something like this, why bother? Why bother, God, sowing seeds of love in places that won't produce any growth, any growth, any life? Come on, God, you know and we know that those are wasted seeds. You're wasting your time. 
if we couldn't bring ourselves to say it to God directly, then we regularly say it to God's church. Why bother? Why bother sending money and supplies to people in places of poverty? It won't make a difference. Then Jesus said the poor will always be with us, right? Why bother feeding those people lining up outside that church waiting to get a meal? They'll just be hungry again tomorrow. Why bother giving them clothes? They should get a job, buy their own clothes. And by the way, they don't take care of the clothes they have now. They're smelly. Oh, I know they don't have a means to go and wash the clothes, but that's their fault. Why bother? Why bother trying to heal the planet of environmental degradation? It's not my problem. And it costs too much for it to fix it up anyway. I can't do anything about that. Why bother? Why bother trying to set up reading camps for young kids to teach them to read more and better as several churches in our diocese are doing across the state? Why bother with the Sutton Scholars Program for high schoolers in Baltimore to get them off the streets in the summertime and to show them that there's a better future for them and we're gonna invest in you? But why bother kids? Why bother with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission trying to stir up things and make us see what we don't want to see? I have no time for that. I don't want to feel bad about myself. Why bother with reparations to repair the wrongs that I had nothing to do, anyway, do with anyway? Why doesn't the church just stick to preaching the gospel and saving people's souls? Why bother? Why bother trying to right the wrongs of generations of a system that degrades people of color or who find themselves in a cycle of poverty, crime, injustice, and violence? I'm no racist, but it seems that nothing we do will ever make a difference in their lives. And we don't want to throw money at those problems. Throwing money at them. I can't think of a more offensive image for the people of God to throw money at them. You know, you only throw money at the poor in our society. It's like throwing paper towels at the people in need. You never throw money at the rich. We're blessed in this diocese to have some schools that are fairly well endowed. And it costs thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars per student. But I never once heard someone say, well, I guess we're just throwing money at the rich kids. Throwing money at the problem. Only a rich person would say that, who has enough of it. There the church goes, slinging seeds, when we know that so many will fall on dry, rocky ground, where they're likely to die. Aren't there enough failures and disappointments in life without setting up ourselves for more? Why do we bother? Why does God bother? Well, if you're in love, you don't count the cost. When you're in love and when you love somebody, you do whatever you can. I grew up in Washington, D.C., public schools in Washington. By the time I was midway through high school, I started to fall through the cracks. The streets, the people around were, were claiming me, drawing me away from being all that God intended for me to be. I was just falling. Some of the teachers could see that. They didn't know what to do. My parents saw that, didn't know what to do. Here's what happened. 
I was rescued by God. There were some people who told me about the love of Jesus and what that could mean in my life. And I was rescued by some of God's loving people who reached down from all over the Washington area to try to pick this young black kid up in Washington, me and my friends. And they spent time with us. They guided us. They made sure that we had more opportunities than the local school system could provide. They invested in me. They believed in me. And that's why I'm here now, 50 years later, because they bothered. My friends, if we can just learn to be as reckless, as extravagant as God is in spreading God's love, mercy, compassion, and justice everywhere, even on rocky soil, then we wouldn't have to insist that everyone in our new community of love clean their plates. No, instead, we're going to give them clean plates. And we will continue to love them, feed them, shelter them, and encourage them, feeding them the bread of heaven until they want no more. At least that's the way I see this parable. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all the people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and people is of our creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. 
for all those who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, friendless, and the needy, for the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all just the truth. For Michael, our presiding bishop, and Eugene and Robert, our bishops, and for all bishops and ministers, for all who serve God in our church, for the special needs and concern of this gathering, we pray especially for all who have been adversely affected by COVID-19 pandemic. The people are invited to voice their own petitions. Hear us, Lord. For your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We pray in thanksgiving for all those who are putting their lives at risk to care for the sick and provide essential services during the pandemic. The people are invited to voice their own thanksgiving. We exalt you, O God, our King. And we praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all those who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. The people are invited to voice prayers for the dead. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Who put their trust in you. We pray for you for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful God. In your compassion, forgive our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. So upheld by, by your spirit that he may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor of the glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Amen. My sisters and brothers, let us exchange a sign of peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Good morning again, and thank you for joining us in our worship. And thank you, Bishop Sutton, for always preaching the word that we need to hear. This is the time when we give something of what God has abundantly given us. It's our opportunity to either give to your own congregation, to the Diocese of Maryland, or the cathedral to make possible incredible opportunities for ministry and mission in a world in such need of such gifts. You can do this by pressing the yellow button above the video screen, which will take you to a link and opportunities to give to the church of your choice. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. my 
Almighty God, your word is cast like seed upon the ground. Now let the dew of heaven descend and righteous fruits abound. Let not our selfishness and hate this holy seed remove, but give it root in every heart to bring forth fruits of love. Let not the world's deceitful cares the rising plant destroy, but let it yield a hundredfold the fruits of peace and joy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Maker of all life, you created the universe where all living things reflect your glory. You give us this great and beautiful earth to discover and to cherish. You give us sun and moon and starlit sky everything that gives us light, light for our eyes, our hearts, our minds. You give us your love even when things go wrong. Jesus knew hurt and pain. Through him you wipe away our tears and fill us with your peace. You made us all each wonderfully different to join with the angels and sing your praise. loving God, because when we turned away, you sent Jesus, your Son. He gave his life for us on the cross and shows us the way to live. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be for us Christ's body and his blood. On the night before he died, when darkness had fallen, Jesus took bread he gave thanks, broke it, and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After they had eaten, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and shared it with his disciples, saying, This is my blood poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. With this bread and this cup, we celebrate his love, his death, his risen life. As you feed us with these gifts, 
Send your Holy Spirit and change us more and more to be like Jesus, our Savior. Help us to love one another as we look forward to that day when suffering is ended and all creation is gathered in your loving arms. And now with all your saints, we give you glory through Jesus Christ in the strength of the Spirit today and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Let us pray together a prayer for spiritual communion. In union, O Lord, with your faithful people at every altar of your church, where the Holy Eucharist is now being celebrated, I desire to offer to you praise and thanksgiving. I remember your death, Lord Christ. I proclaim your resurrection. I await your coming in glory. And since I cannot receive you today in the sacrament of your body and blood, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. Cleanse and strengthen me with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let me never be separated from you. May I live in you and you in me, in this life and in the life to come. Amen. Bishop, will you bless us? And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.